and welcome to The Warshipologist. You're watching a channel devoted to the history of USS Wasp CV-7, and we're looking at her story through photographs and other historical documents. In the last episode, we looked at four photographs taken of the ship during construction on the slipway. This is episode four, and we're going to have a look at the launch of the ship. Tuesday, April the 4th, 1939, and it's a big day for the US Navy who are about to launch their seventh aircraft carrier. We're looking at the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Charles Edison, and his wife, Carolyn Hawkins Edison, who will christen the ship. You can find this photo on the NavSource webpage. I'll put the link in the description below. Charles Edison was the son of the famous inventor Thomas Edison. In 1937, he was appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy by President Roosevelt and in January 1940 was made Secretary after the death of Claude Swanson. During his time as Secretary, he pushed hard for the Iowa-class battleships to be ordered and when he became Governor of New Jersey, Roosevelt made sure that one of the ships was named after his state as a payback for his help in getting him re-elected. The other dignitaries present at the launch are... Admiral William Tarrant, who was the commanding officer of South Boston Naval Base, Mayor of Boston, Morris Tobin, seen in this picture with the First Lady, and Mayor Bergen of Quincy. They're standing on the ceremonial platform at the bow of the ship, and it's a little before 11am. The weather is sunny, but the temperature is in the low 40s, as you can see by the hats and coats they're wearing. This is the first public launch at the shipyard for 10 years, with a reported crowd of 10,000 watching from the yard and the north shore of East Braintree. This image captures the moment of launch. After some digging around, I found some footage of the launch on the Getty website, but I'm not going to pay $500 to show the 10 second clip, so you'll have to make do with a link below. Uh, but in the footage, you can see Mrs. Edison give the hull a decent clout with a champagne bottle and managing to douse herself and a few of the dignitaries for good measure. This photo is significant because at the moment this was taken, tragedy was about to unfold in the skies above. Earlier that day, a flight of six US Navy SBU-2 Corsairs had taken off from the Naval Reserve Air Station Squantum to perform acrobatic manoeuvres over the shipyard during the launching ceremony. Just after the launch, the planes in tight formation climbed to 3,000 feet. All six aircraft banked left to perform a manoeuvre called a Loughbury Circle when there was a collision between two of the planes. One of the aircraft, piloted by aviation cadet Ellsworth Benson, broke apart and the other, piloted by Lieutenant Commander Waldo H. Brown, lost a wing and went into a dive. The crowd watched in horror as Brown bailed out at 200 feet and plummeted to the earth with his parachute failing to open in time. He died instantly as he hit the ground at 44 Bickford Road in East Braintree. Brown's plane came down in the middle of Edgemont Road and Aviation Chief's assistant mate Walter Kirk was thrown clear of the wreck and also died instantly. Number 26 was set afire by the impact and a 74-year-old William Madden was helped from the burning home by neighbours. He died later that day from heart failure. A Dorothy Bess, 22, and living in 32 Shepherd Avenue, saw Brown's plane come down a quarter of a mile away and rushed upstairs to get her baby. The moment she grabbed her child, Benson's plane tore through the ceiling, showering them with debris, and then crashed in the street below, severing a fire hydrant. Both Benson and Aviation Chief's assistant mate John Asalio were killed in the crash. The East Braintree Fire Department received its first distress call at 11.02, barely two minutes after the launch. Crowds from the shipyard rushed to the scene of the accident and some collected wreckage from the downed plane as trophies. And in such tragic circumstances, the USS Wasp was born. Incidentally, if you check out the 10-second footage of the launch you can see a plane passing over the ship in the top left corner. I don't know if this was part of the formation or another plane. The commanding officer at Squantum at the time was a Lieutenant Commander Michael H. Conodal, who will join the WASP's crew when she's commissioned 
in the capacity of air officer. Commander Canodal said his inquiry convinced him that the six Navy planes over the scene of the launching were engaged in conservative flying at the time of the accident, and added that a strong wind might have been a contributing factor to the crash. The victims were Lieutenant Commando Walder H. Brown, 43, of Milton, whose widow, the former Frances Gray, a Detroit heiress, witnessed the launching ceremonies. Aviation Cadet Ellsworth Benson, 26, of Newton, Aviation Chief Carpenter's Mate Walter Kirk, 40, of Quincy, and Aviation Chief Machinist Mate John Ossiello, 35, of Revere. This is a photo of Naval Reserve Air Station Squantum a year before, in 1938, and you can see the six SBU-2s at the back. Perhaps the pilots are also there. Lieutenant Commander Waldo H. Brown was due to be stationed on WASP, and the distinction of being involved in the one and only attack made on the continental United States by Germany in World War I. Dubbed the Battle of Orleans, on the 21st of July 1918, a German U-boat surfaced off Cape Cod and began to direct fire at the tugboat Perth Amboy and several barges she had in tow. Brown was stationed at Naval Air Station Chatham and was dispatched to meet the enemy. Two bombs were dropped, which turned out to be duds, and legend has it that he threw a wrench at the U-boat from 400 feet. No one was killed in the attack, but several crew of the Perth Amboy were hurt. Four barges were sunk, and the Perth Amboy was heavily damaged. This photo was taken a few days after the launch, on April the 10th, and the hull has been moved to the fitting out key. We're looking southwest, and it's a gloomy day at the yard. This is the first photo in which we can see the length of the hull and the numerous openings along the hangar deck. These openings are to help ventilate the hangar and allows planes to be warmed up before being moved to the flight deck and thus improve the time it took to get all the planes airborne. It's interesting to note how the forward flight deck tapers forward. If we look at the plans we can see how this area will have its width extended to minimise the weight of the flight deck over the bow. You can actually see some of the girders that will take the flight deck over the top. The hole in the side is an escape route from the catwalks which are yet to be fitted. The launching cradle has been removed but the lines are still attached to the portholes. If you look at the draft line she's sitting pretty high in the water. There's still a lot of weight to be added to the ship, mainly the island structure, elevators and armament. OK, I think that's about enough detail for this episode. I'd like to thank East Braintree Fire Department History for allowing me to use some of their images. They have a detailed account of the air disaster on their Facebook page, and if you're interested to learn more, I recommend you check them out. Join me next time as the Wasp takes to the sea for her builder's trials.